Hi, everybody. Welcome. I, um, I'm so I'm pleased that everyone is uh, available to join us. I'm just going to say a few words uh, and then I'll, I'll introduce our guests. Um, my name is Lori Cohen. I'm the executive director of the Beagle Alliance. Our mission, of course, is to um, rescue animals from animal testing and to advocate for non-animal use in research. My co-host, in case something in terms of the internet goes, goes wrong, is uh, Mary Pryor, who is the co-founder of our partner Rescue Cage to Couch and also, also our rescue and volunteer director. Um, so welcome. Thank you. We are recording. We're going to have this on YouTube and on our site as we do all our town halls. So I won't, uh, I don't think there's anything else uh, in terms of that to say, but thank you all for joining us. This is a, a pretty special, special town hall. I, I think it, it's something that I'm excited to learn more about. And, and from what I gather, so are you from the comments that we've heard of. So joining us today are Nicole Sapolovsky and Rhea Ackler, Rhea Ackler, who are going to discuss this issue we're going to have I'm sharing my screen so they're going to do a presentation and as per usual we will wait and do some question and answer after but I want to I just want to read this quote prior to starting because I think this is um this is a this is an awesome quote that Nicole sent um, we have largely done advocacy in Ontario and Quebec and are currently in the process of reevaluating the campaign to begin taking a deeper look at legislation, consulting with politicians, legal experts and advocates in order to learn more about how we can make the most effective um, and impactful changes possible. And I, I think that from, from the Beagle Alliance standpoint, I couldn't have said that better ourselves for our own mission in Canada. And I think that's really important for animals in this country. We're lacking in legislation. And I'm very, very curious to, to hear what Nicole and Rhea have to say about that and, and to share their experience. So welcome, both of you. Welcome, everybody. Nicole, I'm going to leave it to you at this point. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Lori. Can everyone see my screen? Can you see the screen? Yep. Perfect. I Perfect. think we're good. Wonderful. Okay. So yeah, thank you so much for having us. It is a pleasure to be here and talk about this really important issue tonight with all of you. We've been working on this particular issue since 2018 in Toronto. I personally have been involved since early 2019 after joining a group of activists who had already begun working on the campaign I had spent some time volunteering and working at shelters with dogs in different places. So this particular issue really resonated with me because it had to do with dogs. I had no idea this industry existed, uh, let alone in Canada. I started to take part in different actions that were occurring in Toronto and the GTA. I watched the documentary Sled Dogs by Fern Levitt and was quite horrified to learn what about what we were doing to dogs in this country. And it really forced me to reflect on my own commonly held belief that dogs were somehow treated really well, respected in this country. They weren't being exploited, they weren't being harmed, but this industry tells us the complete opposite. They're being exploited so tourist groups and companies can make money and provide entertainment. We really both want to thank you all for being here, sharing your time with us. It's really important to learn about this issue so that we can all make informed decisions. So we really do appreciate you being here. I'm going to pass it on to Rhea now. Hi, I'm Rhea, and I feel grateful to be here with you all to share this important issue close to my heart. I have loved dogs, uh, well, all my life, <laughs> and even picked it as my topic in grade six for a speech contest, but I digress. Fast forward, I've been an animal rights activist, or I'd had been an animal rights activist 
this for around five years, but it wasn't until I was invited to an event in 2018 uh, that dog sledding ever even crossed my mind. The event was organized by Ariella Getry Handler, who I want to say was instrumental in bringing awareness of the plight of dogs in the dog sledding industry to our animal rights community. She screened sled dogs, the documentary Nicole mentioned, and that was it for me. Sign me up, I wanted to help. It was, it was so powerful and, and woke me up to something that I never even knew existed. I mean, dog sledding, as I said, hadn't been on my radar and I sure didn't think that, that dogs were ever harmed. I mean, man's best friend. I mean, how could they be? Anyway, all that to say, advocating for the dogs in this industry became a primary effort. And I am blessed to have Nicole as my co-collaborator of sorts to navigate together this daunting and often heartbreaking task of figuring out how to dismantle this industry one step at a time. We, we would also like to give a, a huge shout out to the many amazing activists we've worked with over the years who have played an important role. Because like most issues, it takes a village. So let's get to it. Now let's begin with a brief rundown of what we'll be addressing this evening. I'll let you know that I'll be covering the first half and then Nicole will step in for the latter portion. So we're gonna begin with dog sledding, the origin story, and then we'll move on to beyond the brochure, followed by myths and facts, behavioral concerns, then why the dog sledding industry is an animal rights issue, current regulations governing dog sledding operations and outdoor dogs and our concerns, sled dog exemptions, We'll look at some cases across Canada and what we've done, and then survivor stories. And finally, how you can learn more and stay informed about our plans for 2024. So I always think the best place to start is at the beginning. So I recently read that dog sledding is the oldest form of transportation. And at that time, it was used for hunting and communication, you know, their interpretation of delivery mail. And it was also a means of getting around. The archaeological evidence of dog sledding dates back to like 1000 AD, which is a long time ago. It has been reported by archaeologists that dog sledding was invented by indigenous and Inuit communities in the northern parts of what is now modern Canada, and then eventually spread to other parts of the world. It's important to note that the original dog sleds were somewhat different than those used today. Rather than large sleds pulled by many dogs, traditionally it was just an individual dog hauling a small load, kind of like the, the picture to the left, although to be honest that looks like a fairly large load, um, but usually it was like firewood and other supplies. And as the act of dog sledding evolved, the sheer strength of using several dogs became more widely used. Then greater loads could be transported over longer distance, distances with the weight of the load being more evenly distributed over many dogs, kind of like the picture on the right. Um, nonetheless, the number of dogs attached to sleds of yesteryears were much less than they are today, between two and six dogs per sled then. Today, the industry attaches between four and 16 dogs per sled, depending on whether it's for tourism or racing. Now, speaking of racing, we're, we're not really gonna address races, but I, I wanted to connect the dots between the origin of some of the routes that were taken to transport mail from community to community and the well-known 1000 mile Iditarod and Yukon Quest races, which are supposedly reenactments of these long grueling journeys these sleds took from point A and to point B. The reason these dog sleds set out all these years ago was out of a necessity to stay connected. Well, with modern technology and the internet, there's no longer a need. So why then put these dogs through such 
arduous, strenuous, and dangerous terrain. We'll have to wait for our next presentation when we address this wider topic, but just kidding. We're, we're hoping by the end of this presentation, you'll have a pretty clear idea why. Not only why races exist, but why the commercial industry, when exploiting dogs for sport and entertainment is not a necessity, exists at all. Now, before I move on, I want to address a label that is widely used to describe dogs in this industry, sled dogs, as a way of separating them from the companion dogs that we know and might care for. These dogs are in their own category, seen as working dogs or super athletes by the industry. Although you may hear us reference this term or see it used in the footage we'll share, we are only mirroring what is being used in the industry for the sole purpose that you get a clear picture of just how this industry directly uses a form of dehumanization to normalize and justify the treatment of these dogs. Now, one last important note before we begin. Because the nature of this industry, there are images and footage that we'll share that could be potentially uncomfortable or upsetting to some of you. If you hear content warning uh, before presenting any of these images or footage, it, it's an opportunity to choose to either stay with us or to turn away and mute your sound. Please just do what's best for you. I'm just going to ask uh, just for a moment if 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 anyone has their their sound on, if they could just turn it off, that would be so great. They can mute it. Thank you. Um, so the title of our presentation is Dog Sledding, Life Beyond the Brochure. So we want to try something if you'll indulge us. If everyone can close their eyes, if you're comfortable with that, now, I want you to imagine an image of dog sledding in your mind's eye. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Now take a few moments to really picture it. The environment, the dogs, the sounds. Do you hear sounds? Okay, if everyone is ready, you can open your eyes. Curious, did the image you imagine look like this? A beautiful snowy winter wonderland with beautiful dogs gliding through the glistening snow. Or this, the industry has done an exceptional job peddling an image that glorifies this experience as a bucket list item to check off, that embraces an adventurous, romantic notion steeped in a Canadiana winter wonderland gliding through the snow. Let's be frank. If they were transparent and showed instead the images on this slide, how many people would consider dog sledding ever again? See, most operations have tourists meet them at some beautiful snowy trail, not the facility. Instead, a dreamy place where their adventure begins, where they're met by a group of excited dogs who are finally getting a reprieve from the mundane daily existence, chained to a post with only one repetitive circular motion as their movement. Of course, they're excited to see people and get attention and yes, to run. It is our aim to expose the smoke and mirrors illusion that this industry has intentionally and systematically created to attract tourists from around the world. I'm gonna give you a content warning for the next slide's footage. With this idea of smoke and mirrors, we want to address the myths and facts inherent in this industry. To give you a better idea of what we're talking about, I want to share an excerpt from the film Sled Dogs. Before I share, I want to read a quote by Fern Levitt, the director of Sled Dogs, 
which is a reflection following her first and only sled ride. Following this, I will begin the video for anyone concerned about the content. After an exhilarating ride, I went back to see where the sled dogs lived. What I saw was unexpected and distressing. Hundreds of dogs, all attached to chains several feet long, unable to move beyond their very short restraints. It was an image that I will never forget. hot it is here in the summer. It's brutal. much stress and strain for them to endure. Why would they get bleeding stomach ulcers? Why would their hormones be suppressed and their immune system ruined? Authorities are investigating a Whistler sled dog operation for allegedly slaughtering up to 100 dogs after the 2010 Winter Olympics. He also had to perform execution style killing. He pressed the dogs to the ground and stood on them with one foot to shoot them. Come on, baby. Come on, you can do this. Come on. The first one was Lydia, and she is very shy. She just has a shy personality, so I had to really encourage her. She was totally afraid, scared stiff. She didn't want to go down to the yard. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're just letting the world know that they're not happy. And this is Kia. This is Kia. This 
is Kia. This is Kia. Kia. I still find it difficult to watch that footage. I, I want to share a couple more missing facts to highlight some others we've encountered since we began this advocacy work. They will say that dog sledding promotes a unique bond between mushers and their dogs, that they focused on the trust connection with the dogs and their body language needed to output their performance. They're a team. They call them family. In reality, these industries create outdoor warehouses, relegating their family members to chains 24 seven, except when they are reattached to a shorter chain to pull tourists. Most of their time is spent languishing in the dead of winter and sweltering heat of the summer. They will say that one bad apple does not represent the entire industry. Interestingly, when acts of violence have been exposed, there has never been any thoughtful reflection on their industry, never any recognition or accountability. In its place, only secrecy and defensiveness in this tight-knit community. We have already learned of several operations in Ontario, Quebec, and out west where gruesome, shocking, and heartbreaking discoveries were made. If we were to closely examine all operations, we might conclude they are all rife with violence and exploitation across the board. Perhaps this is an indication that they share more in common than they care to admit. Given they breed and commodify these dogs for money, nothing good ever comes from using living, vulnerable beings when profit is the goal. I could go on. I mean, hopefully, though, you get a deeper sense of the misinformation surrounding this industry. Now, based on what you've seen and heard thus far, can you see why the dog sledding industry is an animal rights issue? Let's explore this a little further. Currently, the dogs in this industry are considered property. And because of this, this industry can get away with doing almost about anything with them. The exploitation of these dogs and the commodification of their bodies for human greed and entertainment robs them of being a dog and existing with choice and autonomy. Dogs are social animals and confinement is unnatural for them. Their behavioral needs are neglected and therefore not met. They are treated like disposable, replaceable <laughs> things, not individuals who deserve protection, respect, and moral consideration. Now, given that we have seen the injustices per perpetrated by this industry, it is now important to share what the animal behavioral experts have, have observed concerning the distress these dogs experience. Now, behaviorists have expressed their concerns about what has been observed as a result of living life as a dog in this industry. Restricted movement because they are tethered creates repetitive circling and pacing and overall frantic movement, which is perceived by behaviorists, and I think just about anyone would agree, as both concerning and abnormal. I think it's important to note that socializing during the first 14 weeks of a dog's life is critical, which makes sense when we think of human babies. However, a dog in this industry is groomed to have one aim, to pull sleds for tourists. Nurturing their daily enrichment is sacrificed because of the nature of this industry. They don't have time uh, or the person power to cater to the individual needs of each dog, not to mention there is no structured playtime or opportunities for sniffing, both essential for the mental health of these dogs. Between the ages of four to six months, the dogs are tethered by chains to individual structures. 
They are essentially isolated and have minimal exposure to socialization and various stimuli, which can contribute to the development of an intense fear of many people, other dogs, and unknown situations. Lifelong tethering, of course, can lead to an increased risk of aggression out of frustration and other behavioral expressions out of extreme boredom. A quote from Dr. Rebecca Ledger, who has a doctorate in animal behavior and animal welfare science. When dogs are tethered, it means that they are often deprived of a variety of physical and mental and behavioral interactions that are important to their well-being. Dr. Ledger goes on to express that these dogs have the same behavioral and emotional needs as our companion dogs. Literally, there is no difference. The industry, however, has done a brilliant job convincing the public that these dogs' needs are somehow different. Now, I wanna share a, a short drone video that was captured by a fellow activist. He actually spent almost a year capturing around 30 facilities across Canada. This facility, or this video, highlights the stereotypical behavior of repetitive circling day in and day out. Now I'm going to give a content warning for the next slide's footage. I wanna to continue to unpack the subject of behavioral concerns impacted by the dog sledding industry. I think this excerpt from Sled Dogs, which includes both <laughs> Dr. Ledger and Dr. Kislak, does a beautiful job elaborating on their concerns from both a behavioral and overall well being perspective. because they get so bored, they eat their water cans because they get so bored. Dogs are naturally quite fastidious creatures. They're forced to have to eat and sleep and eliminate in the same areas. And it goes completely against what their internal needs and their internal drives are telling them. So it's very stressful for them. chained and tethered they never get the opportunity to play with other dogs or explore their environment which is part of their natural instinct that's not a community it's a prison they need to be able to socialize they go from being happy and playful to being anxious, nervous, panicked, depressed, and insane sometimes. Go ahead. I can't watch that. Uh, I'm now going to pass the baton over to Nicole. Why well, there's still pictures? Thank you very much. So I'm going to first start off with talking well, like about the Ontario regulations. So with our uh, focus on this campaign for this year, we have narrowed it down to Ontario. So looking at the, the regulations, the next two slides will cover a summary of the regulations that are within the PAUSE Act. So essentially, it's all there is to protect these dogs. 
uh, who live outdoors. There is quite a bit of information over the next two slides, but I'm just going to focus on a few of the updates that came into effect as of July 1st, 2022. PAWS stands for Provincial Animal Welfare Services. So they are based here in Ontario and they are responsible for overseeing animal related issues and responding to concerns and complaints. I'm gonna briefly point out that as of a few weeks ago, we discovered that there are about 15 operations throughout Ontario and that's just Ontario alone. And there are about 100 PAWS inspectors for the, enti for, the for the entire province, my apologies. That is very concerning to us because these inspectors oversee a wide variety of businesses, operations, industries that use animals to make money, in addition to any complaints or concerns that folks who have companion dogs and cats may call for. So there aren't a lot of resources in place. So that is one of our, our large worries about enforcement when it comes to, to pause. To be considered an outdoor dog, the dog has to be outdoors for more than 60 minutes in a 24 hour period and largely without their guardian or caretaker present. So obviously the dogs who are being used by the dog sledding industry are considered outdoor dogs. It is a complaint based system. There's a, a phone number that you would call if you see something concerning and you would report, they'll ask you questions like the address, what did you see? What day did you see it? And normally they will send an inspector to go and investigate the concern, but there is no follow up, unfortunately. So after you hang up that call, you essentially have no idea what has happened. So some of the changes that came into effect as of July 1st, including it includes having water at all times, which probably seems like it should be a no brainer, but a lot of operations that we have seen, either there's no water, it's in a very rusted can or it's filthy or frozen. So they have to have access to water that's not frozen and is clean and drinkable and should be replaced every 24 hours. A few other updates. So dogs who have uh, been tethered for 24 hours, which is normally how the industry works, they have to have at least one hour of off tether time. So essentially Billy should have 12 to one off in that 24 hour period of time. Now, when I contacted PAWS about a year ago to inquire about this aspect of the regulations, they essentially told me that it's an honor system. So the business owner just has to write down in their notebook that the dog had an hour of off tether time and the inspector is meant to trust that that's actually happening. So that is also very concerning. The oversight is just significantly lacking. In terms of the size of shelter, so the shelter has to be designed in such a way that it is um, allowing space for dogs to stand up, sit down, turn around. So it will differ slightly based on the size of the dog as well. The tethers must allow three meters of horizontal movement around the pole that's been staked in the ground. Three meters is not a whole heck of a lot. Um, but there was a slight increase in that length. Dogs must not be forced to stand, sit, or lay in urine, mud, filthy water. But as we've already seen in a lot of this footage, they are living, going to the bathroom, and eating all in the same place, which is completely unnatural for dogs. Mm -hmm. It's important to keep in mind, and uh, Marcy Moriarty, who is the Chief Protection Agent at the BC SPCA, she's, she has been aware of, of this industry for several years, uh, I think as early as 2010, when the situation happened in Whistler. She says, legislation and regulations are only as good as enforcement and proactive inspections. This is not something that happens in the dog sledding industry. It is normally 
activists or whistleblowers who expose what is happening on these properties. I'm going to give a content warning for the next slide. So sled dog exemptions, the BC sled dog code of practice was something that was designed as a result of what happened in Whistler in 2010. And essentially it provides guidelines on how to properly shoot a dog. And this is a method of euthanasia that has been commonly used across the industry. And the shocking part is that these are government-based recommendations. So it's very troubling that this is something that is considered acceptable to be practiced by these businesses. An exemption that uh, is also something that we're, we're very uncomfortable with. Municipalities across the country have tethering or anti-chaining legislation in place. So in Toronto, for example, where we are from, you can only tether your dog for up to an hour in a 24 hour period of time. If a dog is, has been tethered for more than that, you can contact PAWS and they will send someone to come and, and investigate. But the dogs used in this industry are completely exempt from this sort of legislation. Uh, there is some sensitive content on the next slide as well. So the Whistler call that took place at Howling Dog Tours in BC was probably one of the most tragic cases that we have experienced here in Canada. And I think that it was uh, an eye opener for most uh, Canadian citizens who probably like us had no idea this industry even existed and that this sort of thing had happened to dogs. So after the Winter Olympic Games, tourist numbers dwindled. These operations were not making a lot of money. And so one of the members of staff was ordered to kill a group of dogs. They were shot and killed by any means necessary, which was uh, spoken about in one of the previous videos. It was quite horrific. Many of the dogs did not die immediately when they were shot. So as a result of what had happened here, the BC SPCA got involved. It cost them $250,000 to investigate because they hired highly skilled experts and professionals to dig up the bodies so that they could determine who suffered. So for example, if a dog was shot and it was determined that they died immediately, they quote unquote did not suffer. But if they had, if the gentleman who committed these acts had to further uh, commit violent acts towards dogs who were not, uh, who, who did not die immediately, they would then be considered dogs who suffered. So they spent a lot of time, a lot of resources to determine this so they could present a case to Crown Council and say, this is what happened. These are the number of dogs who suffered. So then the judge could decide what kind of sentencing the gentleman who did this uh, should face. And it, 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 was not, uh, it was not good. It did not serve justice, uh, in my opinion. And the BCSPCA was quite horrified with the outcome. He was sentenced to three years of probation, 200 hours of community service, a $1,500 fine, and only a three-year ban on any commercial involvement with animals. As a result of this horrific case, which made headlines worldwide, a task force formed to create the BC Code of Practice for Sled Dogs, which was meant to be a game changer across the industry. It was meant to prevent anything like this from happening again. It was meant to essentially protect these dogs, but it, it hasn't. With, with this operation, yes, um, the case was uh, investigated, but nothing substantial changed in terms of what happens day to day at these operations. In 2021, 40 dogs were removed from another operation in BC. Many of the dogs 
had suffered from hypothermia and their shelters were decrepit. So if a task force creating this code of practice was really meant to, to change things, then dogs should not, the industry shouldn't exist, but the fact that it got so bad at this particular operation is very, very worrying. And this is why we always go back to how concerned we are about the effectiveness of standards of care, codes of practice and regulations. We find them very, very useless. So I was a sled dog. This is a beautiful project that uh, begun as a result of what happened in BC. Wendy Nesbitt, who is uh, very, very involved with dog rescue out West, she learned about the Whistler call and she started this project in 2012. She met some of the survivors from Whistler and she's still very active in in dog sled rescue operations who are regularly surrendering or shutting down, uh, she's involved. And so it really is a beautiful initiative. It's very, very inspiring because these families get together, they go on hikes, they, they hang out, they share their stories and they come together because they have these precious beings in their lives uh, and that commonality that they do share two quotes on her website in particular that stood out to me, being just a dog is not an option. It's not an option in this industry. The moment these dogs are bred into this industry, they're meant to serve one purpose, one function, to pull a tourist around on a sled. They're happy to just be dogs, individuals with a choice. Their choice and autonomy, as Rhea mentioned earlier, is completely ripped away from them. And so when she got to meet these dogs and got to know their stories and learned more, she, she expressed the same sorts of concerns with the regulations, the, the things that are, you know, approved by the government. Uh, so I believe that her link will be included for you to all check out. Highly, highly recommend checking out her, her website as well as her social media pages. It's just very uplifting amid all of the horror that we are often exposed to. And I will give a content warning for the next slide. So Chalkpaw Expeditions was the largest operation in Canada with 400 dogs at their peak. And as you can see, they truly are outdoor warehouses. So the corner is essentially this is where the dogs lived. They lived in plastic barrels, 400 of them. It was it, it was a mass outdoor warehouse. I, I can't really, I can't find words to describe it in any other way. Um, but they operated for quite a number of years. They were a very popular one where a lot of people from Toronto and the GTA would drive up north and, and go on a dog sled ride. Um, you can actually see in that photo in the corner, the circles from the dogs just running around consistently, the stereotypic behavior that behaviorists find very, very distressing. With Chalkpaw, a whistleblower did come forward. We will show an excerpt uh, next from her. And she told activists about a mass grave site. So. Here we go again, they were shooting dogs who were sick or old, considered surplus, buried with collars. So activists went one evening and dug up this gravesite and documented. And just imagining what the, the dogs around them would have been feeling and experiencing as these dogs were, were shot and killed. This operation did close down in 2019, not for any good reason. It was simply because the owner retired. Unfortunately, in an attempt to rescue dogs, people tried to adopt, rescues tried to intervene. Many of these dogs were just recycled to other operations. So sadly, they did not uh, make it out. But we know of a few who did make it out, thankfully. So um, that's always a, a happy ending story. 
Something also uh, which makes Chalkpaw stick out is that Fern Levitt actually went dog sledding here. She's the one who made the, the documentary Sled Dogs. She went dog sledding here. She asked to take one of the dogs back to where they live and she was horrified. She adopted Slater uh, from there. So Slater spent the rest of his days with her and her family, which is really lovely. Um, but yeah, this, this particular operation, quite horrific. And one day when activists went up to document, they tried to cover the operation with uh, a tarp unsuccessfully. I'm going to be giving a content warning for the next slide as well. So this is Chantelle. She tells a little bit of her story in this little excerpt from the CTVW5 expose, Dogs in Distress, which I believe you'll also have a link for. Um, so I'm not gonna say too much here. I'm going to let her share her experience. Chantal Dosteller was a musher at a now defunct kennel in central Ontario. As the driver of the dog sled, the main caretaker of the dog's day-to-day -day needs, even when there was no snow. You were only two staff taking care of 250 dogs. Two for 250. Yeah. Is that, hum is that humane? I mean, you're working front line with them. Humane to who? <laughs> Can you take care of that many dogs, like give them the proper kind of care? What's your perspective of proper care? Right. Right? I thought it was really insulting that dogs only got one hour off their chain a month in the summertime. I think that was really disrespectful. Oh. One hour of freedom a month. Things started to be said around me that were alarming, such as feed them as little as possible to save money, you know, but not so much that the SPCA gets called. And as a primary caregiver of the dogs, it was really offensive. For years, when tourists asked her about the health of the dogs, she says she lied because she needed the job. So a vet would come around to see these dogs, oh. hundreds of dogs. Mm -hmm. How, how many times? Twice a year. Twice a year. Yeah. For hundreds of working dogs. Yeah. And when the dogs got sick, it wasn't an option to bring the dog to the vet. They would get hidden in the back of the kennel, so people driving by wouldn't see it. And then, Chantal says an end for any dogs management felt were too sick or couldn't pull their own weight. Twice a year, they would hire a hitman. We had seen a mass, mass uh, shooting. They would shoot dogs, spring and the fall. But all the dogs, you can imagine hundreds of dogs barking and the bark was really high pitched, a lot of panic. And you're taking the dogs and you're bringing them to this man and you'd hear the, and then you'd hear the drop of the body onto the next. When management wanted to save money, Chantel says they asked their staff to do the dirty work. You had to do the unthinkable, Chantal. Because it was a lot for me. I was still very young. I'm still young. But uh, yeah, I took the gun, took the bullets, went to the yard. I brought hope. She tells us hope was a sled dog that had been sick for four days. I walked her down to the pit, and uh, nobody had instructed me how to euthanize a dog with a gun. So I shot her in the back of the head, point blank. It definitely broke my heart. It broke part of my spirit to, to like, who am I? Who am I to have euthanized a dog for my employer? You know, why wasn't there vets around? Did you ever think coming into this job you would have to shoot a dog? Nobody thinks that way. Nobody thinks they would have to shoot a dog when they become a dog sled guide. Nobody. The next slide does contain some sensitive content as well. Chantel. So Windrift Adventures is an operation that sadly is still operating. Windrift Adventures is in Ontario. It's located just outside of Barrie, Ontario, and they do have two different locations, not too far from, from one another. 
they've been in the news since roughly 2018 for an absolutely horrendous state uh, with regards to where the dogs are living, how the dogs are looking. So a tourist who went uh, there with her partner, they were just walking around where the dogs lived and they found a dog who had a visible injury on his or her leg and was having a hard time walking. They shared this footage on social media and it blew up. It became a news story. And it seemed thereafter when Drift was in the news on, on quite a regular basis. Between 2019 and 2021, there were about 15 inspections that, that were conducted out of complaints and concerns for the well-being of the dogs. Um, so during that time, between uh, the early months of 2021, Paws went in, they told them to make these changes and make that those changes, and they, they didn't. They didn't feel like they had to comply. They thought that they would be compromising the animal's well-being by fixing the shelters and lengthening the chains and that sort of thing. And so in September of 2021, 239 dogs were removed from both of their properties because they were deemed to be in distress. They were removed by PAWS, Provincial Animal Welfare Services, and the, the OSPCA. When they landed in government care, they were reported to, to be in, in quite concerning health. Some had cancer, some had giardia, bacterial infections. These dogs were not, uh, were, were not in good shape, more or less. And sadly, some of them had been euthanized. We kept up with, with the case and we saw that they were upset, they couldn't operate. So we ended up taking a drone up there in March of 2022 to see whether or not they were operating. And that's the image with the red circles in the middle there. They were in fact operating, they had dogs, they had replaced their dogs who were removed, tethered. They had the sleds lined up and ready to go. They were fully functioning. We contacted PAWS that day to report uh, what we had seen. But again, it's a complaint-based system. You report what you see, and then you have no idea what ends up happening thereafter. Throughout their case, they tried to appeal to get their dogs back numerous times. And it wasn't until early February that they lost their last appeal. The dogs will not be returned and they will remain in government care. We are not privy to the information as to whether or not they will be adopted or what the outcome will be, but we do hope for really loving and understanding forever homes for, for who, who does remain in government care. This operation was also featured in the documentary Sled Dogs. And as you can see here, little Ratchet froze to death while they were filming. And Georgina, who is one of the owners, she just went along with the sled, picked up uh, his body and just dragged him away. These dogs are disposable. Ratchet will be replaced by one of the puppies that they breed into existence and someone else will be... Um, attached to that pole and pulling sleds. It's Windrift in particular is, is quite a horrific uh, case. And um, as I said earlier, sadly, they, they are still operating. They were not able to pay the government back all of the fees that they accumulated while their dogs were in government care. Um, and they lost their defamation suit. So they tried to sue CTVW5 uh, for featuring them, and they lost it, thankfully. Um, and they also lost on a request to collect semen from the dogs who remained in government care. This is common in the industry. They collect the semen in order to maintain the bloodlines. Mm. It's quite despicable. I'm going to give another content warning for the next slide. I'm so sorry, there's, there's quite a lot of heavy stuff here. So XP Milu is, was an operation in Quebec. They did shut down in April of 2022 after having been exposed for gassing and putting dogs into freezers still alive. 
So these allegations surfaced in 2020 when a whistleblower approached a colleague of ours that we work with from the United States and told her what was happening. He had since quit and left, and thankfully he found someone to uh, to share this information with. So we were putting together a campaign to launch to, to demand that the operation be shut down. So we had to wait two years until we launched it because we were also being told that CTV had something in the works. They just weren't sure what at that time. So as soon as the expose launched in February of 2022, we launched our campaign. The two owners and a staff member were all charged with animal cruelty and neglect. Their trial actually just wrapped up last Friday after two weeks in court. And the judge will make his decision on what ends up happening with the, those three individuals in June. In terms of gassing, so as of about two weeks, a week or two ago, there's now a prohibition on gassing as a means of euthanasia in Quebec. Gassing was legal in the province up until recently. However, this contraption was a homemade illegal system. This caused a lot of, of suffering. And as I said, the do many dogs were not dead before they were put into the freezer. And I'm not sure if you can really see, but there along the sides of the freezer, there are traces of blood. Their dogs struggled, adult dogs and puppies. And through access to information requests that the media conducted to really dig deep in this operation, they discovered that there were years and years and years, all the way back to 2008, of concerns with this operation. Now, MAPPAC is the Ministry of Agriculture, and they oversee animal-related issues in Quebec. They went from time to time and issued very minor non-compliance orders, but nothing substantial. But they did have the authority to remove dogs, and they never did. So again, this is a huge issue with the governing bodies and the powers that be. So a lot of dogs ended up suffering as a result of inaction. Finally, something joyful. So a big part of our campaign is survivor stories. We really want to tell the stories of the individuals who have made it out of this industry. And in addition to communicating with their families, learning how they're doing uh, at home, what their quirks are, their favorite things, it also helps to dispel, dispel some of the myths around these dogs not being able to be companions. And I just want to point out that any dog who may have experienced trauma or a rescue dog of, of any kind from any sort of troubling environment will have some difficulty adjusting to home life. There's, there's no exception. But to make this grand statement that these dogs cannot find happiness and joy in a home with a family is the furthest thing from the truth. And unfortunately, as a result of how under socialized they are when they're young, it, it does make things a little bit more challenging. There's no question about that. Millie and Jack are two survivors from two operations in Quebec. Jack is from Milou. Thankfully, he made it out of there. And he and Millie now live together with, uh, with a lovely family here in Ontario. Millie was pregnant when she was rescued. Imagine giving birth in the snow in one of those plastic barrels in an unsanitary environment. And her baby's probably taken away maybe a few short weeks after so that she is is back to work um but yeah it, it is important to shed light on on the survivors because it allows us to have that renewed sense of hope and the urgency at the same time these individuals are worth advocating for they're worth speaking on behalf of and sh and sharing their stories and I just want to really highlight our desire to be pulled on a sled for some tourist experience 
or to win a prize at the end of some race does not supersede the right of these dogs to not be exploited for human greed. And it does not supersede that. Each of these dogs has their own likes, dislikes, just like any dog, right? They enjoy things, they find things enriching, they find things scary. And we are just meant to be their, their guardians to, uh, to guide them along and, and advocate for them as much as we possibly can. So stay connected, stay informed with us, follow us on social media. If you have questions or want to connect, you can feel free to email us. We highly, highly urge out of anything else that you will do after tonight, please take some time to watch the expose and the documentary. I believe you have been provided with those links. They are both free to watch online. They are very heavy. There's a lot of heavy material but it is important to bear witness so that we know exactly what is going on. And it gives us all the more reason to not only not support the industry in any way, but also educate others and tell them why they shouldn't support it either. And lastly, I was a sled dog. Absolutely check out Wendy's website and her social media pages. To wrap up, we just wanted to share a rescue story. So a compilation of footage was put together um, as a result of us going to Miloop. A group of us did go a couple of times to Miloop in April, 2022. They had a weekend adoption event after they announced shutting down. And uh, it, it was quite, it was bittersweet to be there knowing all the horror that took place towards many of the dogs and the joy of, of getting the remaining individuals out of there. So while you're watching this, and once we all leave here tonight, please, please deeply consider the life of these dogs. They deserve better. They don't deserve this life. They don't deserve to be bred into it just to pull us around on a sled. And let us also reflect on the life, generally speaking, the life beyond the brochure that we're often told is some beautiful romanticized experience. Let's always remember the, the individuals who pay the ultimate price at the end of the day. Thank you all so much for being with us and please enjoy this lovely video.
Thank you guys. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Um, I just want to, can you guys hear me? <laughs> mm -hmm. Check. Okay. Well, that, that was beyond, um, that was absolutely incredible. Thank you both so much. Um, I know we're going a little bit longer than we usually do, uh, but I'm so, so happy that everyone has stayed on. And, and I just am really looking forward. Sorry, I'm moving around because my cat somehow wants to be here right now. So I, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, that was incredible. And, and thank you both for what you're doing. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing from Wendy and, and everyone else. Uh, the links are in the chat. Uh, I was putting them in as we were going along. So I hope that everyone received them. Um, I, I just, before we move on, just because I'm the one speaking right now, I just want to, if you all indulge me, I just want to say how ignorant I have been about this situation. And I also want to speak to the absolutely staggering, staggering, uh, similarities to the animal testing world um, that that you've presented with with regard to the dogs and the treatment and the legislation and the lack thereof in the it, it's abs it, it just and I I don't want to take away from what you've said I want to I want to make the similarities because Canada is so behind they are so behind and everyone thinks that Canada is so nice and we are, <laughs> but we're too nice because we don't say anything. And mm -hmm. what's, this is the result of that. So I just want to say that um, as a Manitoba girl, you know, who grows up, who has grown up in, in winter and uh, in the magical world that is winter, um, you know, there was something magical about the Iditarod. There was something magical. I, and I am, I am ashamed to say that growing up, one of the things I wanted to do was to be, to sled dog, that to go on a trip like that, um, I absolutely believed that those dogs were loved by the people caring for them. Like I, I am, I I am horrified because I completely believed that these were actual like companion dogs that these people they they trained them and they wanted to do it and they and there was a camaraderie with the dogs doing this. And, and I feel so ignorant saying that, but I want to say that because I think that I'm not the only one and I want to make sure that other people are okay saying it without feeling horrified and very ignorant growing up in this country and thinking that and, and outside of this country. But, um, so I just want to say that, um, but also I want to, I want to, I want to just momentarily uh, speak to the similarities in the animal testing world. Um, the prison, the behavioral issues when they come out, the laboratories tell us that they will never be domesticated, that they can never go into loving families. And yet we've proven it time and time again. And, and, Many of you here know that, and, and Mary and I have seen that repeatedly for years, that of course they go in and have amazing families and live the rest of their lives. And Jill, of course, have, has seen that, and, and we've witnessed that. And so that that alone is such a lie that they can't go on to live these lives after this kind of trauma. Um, the... Also, momentarily, I just want to speak and then I'm just going to open it up, but I just want to speak to the fact that the musher went into it thinking that it was a great thing. And, and we have, um, and we've done town, uh, town, town halls on this and we've spoken with people, animal care workers 
who have gone into the laboratories thinking they can help animals and not realizing what has what transpires after they're in there and the PTSD and and the things that just as um the woman musher had said that she never believed that she would do those things and that that's what she would be asked uh the similarities are staggering but again i don't want to take away from the dog sledding industry i just want to really emphasize the fact that canada has a lot of work to do a lot anyway thank you guys um i'm going to stop talking and i'm going to just open it up like for anybody of course we we can go as long as you want it doesn't matter you know that we're overtime under time there's no time so whoever has a comment or a question and again I do at some point want to hear from Wendy and so please um go ahead did I mute everyone <laughs> sorry maybe I did but if you want to raise your Zoom hand, I will like call upon you, but I'm hoping that I didn't mute everyone. Um, if you can't unmute, let me know. And uh, other than that, let's 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 talk about this. Why don't we start with Wendy? Hi. Hi. <laughs> I wasn't really prepared to talk or anything. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I, I just kind of heard about this and I was, I was like, watching I'm... your comments and Thanks I just... to Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> um I just wanted to say too, like um with Whistler, it this disconnect because I, I spoke to um, one of the mushers that was working at that time and it took place over two days with a regular day of operations in between right so April 21st there were dogs killed staff came to work some dogs were dead they knew something had happened you know but regular operations went on you know to the excursions and then there was more dogs killed on the 23rd so like there's I think what she had said to the uh, musher I spoke with was like, you just went to work and did your job. And this, it was kind of expected that, you know, some dogs, they didn't really understand the extent of what had happened. And at least that's what, you know, she said, but they're young, you know, like a lot of the, the mushers, they were in their early twenties and they were from all over the world coming to Whistler to, you know, work in this industry and it was exciting and they partied and they played with the dogs and it was just this, a very different, different thing. And it, it was, it was interesting um, to hear from her. I, I, but there is really this disconnect and what they feel like could be normal. I think with Chantal, who was in the video. Um, yeah, that was part of what she thought it was like, you come to work to, you know, be a, a, a dog sled guide, but this is, there's a lot more to it that ends up happening that if you're young and, and don't speak up, what happens, right? What do you get pulled into? Yeah. And I don't think they understand the gravity of it because it's normalized in that industry. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And it's such a good point because um, that will never leave her, obviously. Um, that kind of trauma will probably never leave her and and what happened there um and just going in innocently and thinking that you're going to do this job and it's going to be about animals and you're going to care for them and 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 that's it's just a it's a shame that 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 will stay with her and so many others really yeah yeah what it's done to the, the people too yeah um, to the people too and, and that exactly. are involved in it yeah yeah, and that's the thing is that um, so much of animal advocacy it includes what it, it includes the trauma to the humans that are a part of this. I, I don't think we're made to harm uh, individuals. I, I think it hurts us to the core, um, no matter how we hide it or justify it or 
live in denial about it, but I think it hurts. It's not just an animal advocacy issue. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's just an overall harmful, um, societal issue. Yeah. I, th I think with the, the, um, plant dog industry as well, a lot of, at least in BC and, um, most of what I know is from just out West here, but, you know, a lot of, um, the dog yards are, are very remote. Um, so when it comes to reporting, when it comes to, it, it's up to people who go on excursions, unfortunately, yeah, to be the ones who bring this to light. Yeah. Um, because oftentimes, <laughs> um, there are those that do report and make reports, don't get listened to you know, being crazy dog people or, you know, <laughs> or, yeah. um, or they're just, you know, the, their names are known and they just don't get listened to and they get dismissed. So I think, um, you know, I think that's some of the experiences that we've had out this way. So it's important to, to have more people, have more voices. Um, and I think it's fantastic that, that you all joined forces for this presentation. Um, because I think the more voices and the more people who are just, who are, you know, we're all doing our little bits of things, but it's important that we're all focusing on little bits of different things so that we can come together and bring our experiences and bring our knowledge together to help make this change because it's it's not gonna change on its own, right? Like it's it's gotta be people standing up and speaking out and knowing the laws and, and holding the people that can affect change to, um, it's <laughs> like hold them to the standard, hold yeah, them to the law, hold them to yeah. the, the regulations, right? Like yeah. it's ridiculous that it's, you know, I think Nikki, um, who's here from out west here too, she's hiding. <laughs> um, but, you know, her and another person out here were having um, conversations with the Minister of Agriculture. And I, you know, it just kind of, I don't think it really went anywhere. It just ministers change. And, um, you know, when there's cabinet changes and it's it's mm -hmm. so hard to navigate. Mm -hmm. So it's important that there's lots of people who can, sorry, I'm rambling on here. <laughs> I'm getting passionate oh. now. No, you're, yeah, you're that's, not. That's what happens, right? Like it, there's so, there's so many moving parts. So it's, it's, it's important that the more voices that can, can take on just a little bit, that way not everyone's taking that load, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and it's true. And there are so many moving parts. Unfortunately, in this country, the moving parts are so mm -hmm. slow. Um, yeah. You can barely see them. And um, and certainly, I just want to, again, thank Nicole and Rhea, because uh, honestly, <laughs> the Beagle Alliance is taking no credit for this presentation. <laughs> we spoke, I, I, Nicole and I've been chatting for years and we kind of spoke before the holidays and I you know just knew how much she was doing in the animal world and I asked her hey what, do you want to be on a town hall and then and then she said whatever you want to talk about you know I'm I, we're good <laughs> I you know whatever you want to say so it was actually um it, 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 we didn't pursue this subject and, and I'm so, I feel so blessed that this is what you chose to speak about Nicole and to have Rhea on. And, and I mean, I, cause this was not something that we pursued and, and I'm just feel really, really happy and blessed that you spoke about this. Cause this is um, something I personally didn't realize. And I know some others didn't. I'm really um, happy it'll be on our site, and and if we can share it and promote it and talk about it in any way, I I just am really happy about that this is happening. Um, and I, I'm not sure what your experience is, Nikki. I I know that I've already put Wendy on the spot without trying to. <laughs> And so I don't want to do that a second time, but if you want to, if you want to chime in fine, but of course, if anyone else has any questions, um, I'm going to throw, while you guys are thinking about your questions, I'm going to, um, throw this out there to Nicole and Rhea, like, 
as you had said, uh, and obviously the the focus we're talking about Ontario, we're talking about Quebec, we're talking about British Columbia. Um, what about the prairie provinces who who um, you know live in in winter and and have northern tourism in Churchill? And I mean, tourism is big in in our northern provinces as you guys might not imagine, given that it might be 40 below on a given day, and that's not something you'd ever want to deal with, but it is a big deal. So tell me about the cross Canada dog sledding world, if you can. Do you mean, um, what what the landscape is across Canada in terms of the tourist side of things? I mean, what's your experience with other um, with the dog sledding industries in other provinces outside of the Ontario, Quebec, BC world? How, do you have any experiences with them uh, with the other provinces? Do you do you know uh, what goes on or has there been anything, any any kind of investigation into that area of the country? The only thing that I'm aware of is so one of the races that Rhea mentioned at the beginning, the Yukon Quest that takes place in the Yukon Territory. Um and there has been footage that has been captured there that has been concerning. So it's the same sort of thing in terms of uh, what you would see at the Iditarod, right? It's a mass race. Now it's not. I think it's been uh, shrunk down to shorter uh, races in the Yukon. Um, but essentially how it works is operations bring their dogs from different provinces to these races. So the transport alone can probably be quite uh, strenuous on the dogs, depending on how far and, and what they have to endure. But um, I don't know if I saw Ashley Keith in here. She is from the U S she knows this industry in and out. Ashley, Ashley, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. But We're all just like putting to... people on the spot. We're just all putting people on the spot today. <laughs> she says she has no camera or mic. That's okay. convenient. <laughs> uh, so, but, but yes, when I was referring to the whistleblower at me, Loop, he contacted her. And that's how we found out about what was happening. So it seems... Because we're based in Ontario, that's where most of our focus has been, but we've been made aware of situations in, in BC, in Alberta. We did a joint uh, effort with activists a couple of years ago in Alberta, and they actually all got arrested when they trespassed. Um, and we, you know, have done similar things and the same sort of thing could have happened to us. So it does depend on, on law enforcement, who you're dealing with. Um, but that is a good question, you know, and I think that part of our um, learning is knowing what is actually happening in different places. The reason why we've decided to focus in Ontario is it is largely um, a, a few of us uh, who are working on this campaign, including someone else here. I don't know if they're comfortable with me naming them, so I won't at the moment, but um, she's just recently joined us. But it's hard to tackle a lot when there's so few of us. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it's important to know because when questions like this arise, I think it's good to at least be able to speak on it. You may not be an expert on that particular province, uh, but now, now I am interested to know what's going on. I think Ashley commented and said something that it might not be so good in, in Churchill either. I was um, going to say, and, and that's, I want to, I'm, I'm already like, I'm going to get off this zoom and start researching whether I should be going to Churchill to document this because that's in Manitoba, of course. And right. 
And that's a major tourism. And, and I have many people that I know have gone to church. I mean, it just starts, you know, your brain starts going because we're in these communities and, and I know full well that this kind of tourism happens in this, in my province. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm just, it's, it's a curious, it's a curious thing as to, you know, what kind of witnesses we can get to this really. I think whenever, whenever animals are being used for entertainment or tourism, you can almost always guarantee that there are going to be concerns because if profit is the motivator at the end of the day, then the well-being of the animal will almost always be compromised. Well, and, and sadly mm -hmm. in, in, and I will again, correlate this to the animal testing world, um, granted the belief is that human health is the focus. Mm. Um, but that's, it's already been proven that the animal use model doesn't translate and therefore why are we doing this? And so it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's interesting. Again, it, the, the correlations have been quite amazing. Um, and they really do just illuminate further the lack of, legislation, regulation, concern for animals in this country. As much as we make small changes, they're they're far too slow. They are too slow, absolutely. And even when these regulations were updated in July of 20, 2022, there's an operation just outside of Timmins and he was going on to his social media daily complaining about the upgrades that he had to make, how expensive it was. And, you know, it, yeah, it, it's just m money is the motivator. And um, when we're making money off of the backs of animals, for, for us, in our, in our opinion, how we stand on this issue, that's, that's not okay. Yeah. 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 And if I can just add, I think it's very interesting that, you know, profit is where it's at and if you can use the least amount of money for caring uh for the well any non-human animal <laughs> you know really um but in this case uh the dogs i mean that seems to be like you said the the overriding motivation is to spend because because they're replaceable because they're breeding them right because they're breeding them if something happens to one or two or three or five or ten uh well that's okay because uh they're disposable and they're replaceable yeah. which is so scary you know to think that their value and respect you know for these breathing living beings you know human supremacy is a real thing <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, and and that reminds me of something that you guy you had mentioned at the end, um, just near the end of your presentation, is about how and I just made a note about how the dogs were bred into this, and again, it's the same with the animal testing world. The dogs are bred into it. Yeah, they have never seen. I mean, again, I just it's aside from the entire industry being so enlightening. Um, and what you what you both said and, and discussed so enlightening the the similarities also given that um, uh, given our mission the Beagle Alliance and Cage to Couch the the similarities and the responses about how they can never go into homes and I mean it's just like it's like this blueprint of what's gonna you know stop people <laughs> you know. <laughs> And and it's just, it's horribly deceptive. It's horribly deceptive. Um, so I just, unless anyone has any other questions or comments, um, I just want to ask you, Rhea and Nicole, uh, I think we all have a reason as to why we're passionate about whatever we're passionate about, be it animal testing, be it whatever breed of dog or animal. I'm just curious personally, because you guys are very professional and you've just done an amazing job of, of presenting this to us. 
what would what's the personal what's the personal like are I, I mean I'm a dog person I'm an animal person but I'm a dog girl first and foremost mm -hmm. uh, what's the personal for for you both how, how did this become the thing for you I, th I think I think part of it is because there's such a deception about around dogs. You know, I think that we both kind of touched on it in our introduction, never thinking kind of like what you sort of said, like, you're like, what the heck? You know, how is this possible that this is actually happening? Because honestly, man's best friend, right? right? That right? was ingrained. Yeah. That yeah. was ingrained, you know? And I mean... I think, you know, I mean, ever since I was a kid, like I said, I have always loved dogs. I always wanted, you know, to have a companion animal. I always wanted to, um, but I think it was different. I, you know, I think back then it was more about, I use words like own, I wanted to own a dog, but I now know through the work that we've done as animal rights activists, that, that possessive possessiveness or possession you know um it's 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 about changing the language um because we are they're not here for us you know we're here together you know and there has to be that level of respect and so after seeing that movie I think um I just felt like dogs I get like dogs I understand and I feel like there was also in some of the um, advocacy work that was happening in the animal rights community, there was this idea of one, why one, why love one and not the other? Mm -hmm. And it was a picture of a dog and then a picture of uh, a cow or a pig or a chicken or whatever. And we were like, this is deceptive too because it's misinformation because dogs are being harmed mm -hmm. you know it's like it's it's misinforming the public to think that dogs are a-okay and they're not they're not so um i don't know I, I i i'm so lucky that i have nicole here and that we work so beautifully together and that we've worked with people like ashley who's hiding um and others um who have kept it going you know and i feel hopeful i feel hopeful that we can eventually make a difference but like everything and like any kind of social justice issue it takes like a uh, persistence and con consistency and perseverance and a lot of grit you know a lot of heart like you know you get knocked down a couple times too um, but you have to have hope. I, I don't believe that hopelessness should ever win, you know? So. Yeah, I appreciate that. And and that's amazing. And I, I think, uh, and I just, I, I'm not sure if you uh, saw, we did a reminder post today for, for the event. And, um, and I know she's already left. She had to log off, but you, you already made a difference before the town hall even started because one of our friends and volunteers in Minnesota who helps with our rescues, um, she had a planned trip. And, and I don't know if you guys saw this, but she had a planned trip uh, with her family and on the excursion lift uh, list was a dog sledding experience. And uh, she, as soon as we posted that you were going to be our next town hall, she messaged us and said, I'm done. I just canceled it all. We're not, I mean, wow. before you even spoke so the amazing. fact that it was an issue. So that's pretty, that's, that's pretty powerful. And mm -hmm. 
you know, it takes, it takes one by one, right? We, we always say one beagle at a time, one beagle at a time. If we focus on the 11,000 beagles in animal testing, well, you, you do sometimes lose hope. You do sometimes get a little bit like, how are we going to do this? But for every animal that's released from animal testing, no matter what country, it's an animal saved and you just kind of mm -hmm. take it step by step. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's a, important. that's so great to hear. Yeah. Nicole, how, what about yourself? How, what, 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 why this? Well, I think I could easily just say, you know, I'm a dog lover. I really care about dogs, but I think for me, it took a little bit more learning because when you learn about their behavioral needs or social needs or emotional needs, if you work in any capacity with a dog in a shelter who may have come from trauma, and even if you have companions in your life, I'm dog sitting at the moment, I have some one little guy sleeping by my feet right now. And, you know, just picturing them out there in minus 40 degrees attached to a chain, a mother giving birth to her puppies in a plastic barrel. What kind of life is that? It's, it's not fair. No one deserves to have those experiences. And I think that we don't often get told the the side of of that story either and that's something we want to delve even more into is the behavioral side and you know bo their body language what are, are they communicating things to these people and not being listened to there's so there's so much about it um and of course the industry views you know all dogs the same but every individual is their own individual with their own desires, what they like, what they don't like, what they're afraid of. Um, and a lot of dogs who come out of this industry are petrified of rain and thunderstorms. And I think it's pretty obvious why. They're, they've are they spent most of their lives living outside in it with no proper way to escape. They have no choice. They're forced into this life. They're forced to do these things. And I think that we as individuals have to start to reflect on are my choices impacting others and what else could I do in the winter ski snowshoe skate hike you know um a dog pulling a sled is not a necessity for their survival it's not something that they have to do in order to live a full and meaningful life. And I think that's another misconception that we're told. Yeah, I agree. They're bred for this, you know? Um, I, agree. I agree. And I, I want to state again my own ignorance about the fact that I believed there was this camaraderie between the dogs and the mushers and the people who did. I mean, I literally am sitting here telling you, even in a world that I am in that, I, you know, I'm an animal advocate and, and know about the lies they talk about in animal testing. And yet here I am, you know, and, and I didn't mean to cut you off, Nicole, but it's so astonishing because I truly believe that they were this magical snow covered, beautiful princess, you know, we can make up all the world name, you know, that they were just living this awesome life that they were working dogs and they loved it. Yeah. I it, mean, they're, they're trained from puppyhood. Right. And, uh, as we saw in the footage, Georgina was just yanking little Lydia around, uh, like a piece of garbage uh to see stuff like that happening yeah. it's just not okay and it should not be tolerated ever no being dog or other should be treated like that it's disrespectful and um yeah so i do i do care a lot about dogs and i think that yes as an activist there are so many issues to tackle but going back to what ria had said even among the activist community Many people believe that dogs, we don't really have to advocate for them because they're doing okay, but we really do. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So, and, and they, they, they do have voices. They communicate, they let us know things. We just don't listen or honor. Um, so there, there's so much more to learn. And, you know, Lori, we were in the same place. We did not know about this issue. And many, many people don't know a lot about what's going on in our own backyards. I mean, Barrie is just an hour north of us. And I had no idea that Windrift was there. Right. So it's it's very easy for, for these businesses to be hidden away. Um, and my hope, I hopefully... I was going to say in my lifetime, but I hope it's well before that, that if there's one operation that gets shut down permanently and never has access to dogs again, that it is Windrift Adventures. Yeah. Yeah. They sure. are horrific. Yeah. No, yeah. fair enough. And, and I, I appreciate that because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the way we feel about ITR. It's the way we feel, you yeah. know, I mean, it's, it's, I, I understand. Um, I'm open to, to the fact that people can change and that industry Absolutely. Change, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'll remain open to that, but if, if you're not making that change and, and showing that, then you need to stop and we need to stop you. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, yes exactly right exactly yeah, yeah. yes and so <laughs> I, I I don't know how else to say it but we and and it's funny because you know people will say oh thank you for what you're doing but there's no individual that can do this there's no individual that can do this and there's no individual organization that can do this mm-hmm and as cliche as it sounds, and we say this all the time, but it really does take a village and it is going to take the village to do to make a difference for animals in Canada and, and, yeah. beyond. but we have to start first in our own country. And that's, yeah. that's where we are. So, and, and we, and we may even have to start within our own provinces. A hundred percent. You know, before, before we sort of come together as a yeah. higher country is, you know, I mean, we we did at some point, we were connected with some of the activists uh, out east, out west, you know, all around. And it, we were just talking the other day, at some point, it'll be great to reconnect with those people um, to see what we can do together. Because, mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, interestingly enough for, for us, um, we've had to start outside of the country because so many people don't know that animal testing, same as you guys, so many people don't know that animal testing even happens in Canada. We're, we're trying to prove to people, the general public and the CCAC and the right, you know, everyone that these animals can be rehomed. And thankfully we've been blessed to be able to place animals from laboratories across, you know, the U S and outside um, just to lay a foundation, right? Like just mm -hmm. to lay a foundation that says the, these, these animals can do okay. Like, and we can make that work, but it, it's, but you're right it your own backyard has to see that and then mm -hmm. moves outward and and that's kind of the key um I just I want to thank you guys so much like this was this is probably uh, the longest town hall we've ever done number one <laughs> I think it's uh, um, and and I just just because there's so much to talk about. And now I think we're at the point where we could all just be at each other's houses, having this back and forth conversation on zoom right now. Um, <laughs> but I thank you both. And I, I do, I would love to stay in touch and, and, and maybe talk about my trip to Churchill and, <laughs> and, um, and yeah, just as you say, like work together because there's a lot of similarities here. And I, I think that, you know, we, it does take the village and, and we don't have to focus on one area. It's really about animals and the care of animals in this country, which is lacking. And, Absolutely. Um, and, and that is going to take all of us to work together for sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, thank so you thank all for you. this opportunity. 
Oh my gosh. No, thank yeah, you. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, no, I just, I can't thank you enough. And of course I can't thank all of you for, for joining. And, and of course the people who have had to leave probably cause it's gone on, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um Again, it'll be, we'll, we'll let you guys know when it's on our site, of course, and on YouTube and, and we'll, you know, repost and, and just really encourage people. And of course, um, probably email you guys tomorrow so we can keep in touch and we'll just uh, Wonderful. fight Perfect. the good fight. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So much. And well, thank you, Wendy. It was nice to meet you on here. Yes. I'm so glad that you hopped on. That's amazing. <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot, Wendy. <laughs> you, you yeah, I, don't, I don't know what came over me. I don't usually do this stuff. So it was like, okay. But no, thank you. I, I really appreciate this this partnership, this kind of getting together. So thank you yeah. very much, Shreya. And um and Lori and Nicole that for you know, absolutely everyone who's joined in to listen and chime in and stuff and yeah. there's nothing like uh, yeah I could talk about this stuff all night so <laughs> <laughs> well maybe we should do a private zoom yeah. but anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you all but thank, thank you. you all so much and we will definitely be in touch thank you guys okay. <laughs> take care. Care. Thank bye, you. bye. <laughs>